Hello, and thanks for joining us for our weekly film show with our critic Lisa Nesselson. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Lisa. And we're starting with Joker. It won the top prize, the Golden Lion, at the Venice Film Festival, and Wacom Phoenix is being tipped for an Oscar. It's raking it in at the box office since it was released a few days ago. Does it live up to the hype? Um, well, I don't get it. It's fine. It's entertaining in a downbeat register. The acting is of very high quality. Uh, the Gotham City of the early 1980s is lovingly created in a scuzzy way, but I'm not at all sure we actually needed a so-called origin story about this particular character. For me, this went in one eyeball, out the other. Um, if you really want an origin story, then stay tuned till the end of the program when we will tell you how none other than Victor Hugo helped create Batman's nemesis, the Joker. Now, I have no idea why so many people are drawn to this character. France's premier magazine did a feature recently on the 20 greatest screen villains of all time, and the character of the Joker came in in the top three slots, uh, played respectively by Jack Nicholson in third place, Joaquin Phoenix in second, and Heath Ledger in first. Now, there's a theory that the strongest villain known to humanity is the devil. But we don't really talk about the devil much anymore, not in church even. So Hollywood-style villains may have taken up the slack, and some of us are deeply devoted to watching their antics. Okay, well, tell us more about the film. Well, Phoenix plays Arthur Fleck, an aspiring stand-up comedian who lives with his mom, has undergone psychiatric care, and is about to run out of the medication he really needs because of cutbacks uh, in Gotham City. Now, he starts out as a mild-mannered guy who's a clown for hire who just wants to make people happy. He has an involuntary and misunderstood condition where he breaks out unexpectedly in a maniacal, annoying laugh, the way some people have hiccups that won't stop. Being abused and bullied as a child and as an adult, being blamed for stuff you didn't do and coming into possession of a gun, uh, this probably won't end well. Okay, well here's Wackin Phoenix on how he relates to the character. There are times where I feel such sympathy for him. Um, and there are times where I'm repulsed by him. Um, it either is what, he, what he's been told his whole life, which is that he has this condition and that uh, creates this involuntary laughter at inopportune moments during emotional stress. You think this is funny? Is this a joke to you? Murray, one small thing. Yeah. When you bring me out, can you introduce me as Joker? At least there's been some concern about the violence and anarchy in this film, hasn't there? Well, you know, I really despair at the way pop culture gets covered sometimes nowadays. If these disgruntled, presumably young men who are going to cause trouble um, are so potentially dangerous, then why do we only worry about them when a specific movie comes out? Shouldn't they be cause for concern, even if Todd Phillips had not made it? Joker. Um, there, there were special police details in many U.S. cities opening weekend. Fine. What if the unhinged rabble rousers come on Wednesday or on week three? Warner Brothers made an official statement that the film does not condone real world violence. And can you see the ad campaign if that were not the case? See Joker, the movie that tells you how to murder people and <laughs> ransack cities, especially if you're a mentally ill social midfit. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Okay, Lisa, thank you. Let's move on then to Gemini Man, starring Will Smith. It's the latest film um, from Ang Lee, who brought us Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Brokeback Mountain, and The Life of Pi. Smith plays a 51-year-old hitman. He also plays a digital version of himself, uh, a 23-year-old clone. Is it any good? Well, I was born under the sign of Gemini in May, so like, this is a totally great movie. Actually, it's not a great movie, far from it, but it's a significant experiment, one that only viewers in Asia will be able to fully appreciate because that's the only part of the globe where they actually have the equipment to show this projecting properly. Now to simplify, movies don't really move. A phenomenon called persistence of vision can sling 24 individual still photos together to give the impression of one second of movement. So 24 frames a section, second is the standard of projection the worldwide. 
that th this was shot at 120 frames per second. If it's projected back at that rate, the images are so immersively hyper-realistic that they actually seem to leap off the screen. Everything here looks unnervingly crisp as a result, and heightened reality really does no favors to what is a so-so script. Okay, so what's it about? Well, uh, Will Smith plays Henry Brognan, a phenomenally gifted sharpshooter. He's not a freelance mercenary, he's a patriot. He squeezes the trigger as a paid assassin for the US government. And at age 51, he has now killed 72 people in the service of his country, and he wants to retire. But he can't be permitted to just kick back and relax, but not for the usual reasons one finds in movies, such as uh, that he knows too much or because a foreign power is out to get him. He must be eliminated because his youthful clone has been raised to be a perfect soldier, superhuman but unencumbered by human feelings. The basic premise is outstanding. There's real food for thought here, but I left the theater kind of hungry. Okay, well, it sounds interesting. Let's take a look. So do you think this film might mean there'll be a time when we don't need human actors at all? <laughs> that could be where we're headed, not right away. Gemini Man is a game changer on a technological level, but a game remainer the samer on a narrative level. Now, Will Smith has always been an incredibly appealing leading man, whether it's in 1993's uh, Six Degrees of Separation in the uh, Men in Black films or the misunderstood and underappreciated 2008 superhero comedy Hancock with Charlie's Theron, but there's something that just doesn't work about denouncing the evils of cloning via digital cloning. Okay, we're well, moving on to a French film that's called On a Magical Night from Christophe Honoré, which is out this week. Cara Mastriani won the Best Performance Award in the Cannes Film Festival side by Uncertain Regard for her portrayal of a married Paris law school professor who sleeps with young men for recreation. Tell us more. Well, watching Chiara Mastriani is almost always fun, but also disconcerting. And that's because her mother is Catherine Deneuve, her father was Marcello Mastriani, and you see both of them constantly in her face, sort of toggling back and forth like a flicker toy. As a legacy of looks and talent, uh, her gene pool is close to the pinnacle, but she's rarely cast in comic roles like this one, and it turns out she has a knack for it. Okay, well, here's Mastriani on her role. Christophe, quand il a commencé à écrire l'histoire, when Christophe started writing the film, he said you wanted to write a female character with cliches you would normally associate with men, such as being disingenuous, lying, cheating, for example. So I was very intrigued and amused by the idea because playing someone disingenuous is actually quite fun. Jouer la mauvaise foi, c'est très jubilatoire. So this movie is a stylized, very stylized romp set on a street in Montparnasse in the course of one night. Now, Maria has been married for 20 years to Richard, played by velvet-voiced singer and actor Benjamin Biele. He discovers she's been cheating on him for ages with an impressive number of always much younger men, and he's stunned because he's always been faithful to her. We don't often see a female character who has zero compunction about behaving like a man when it, become, when it comes to what she calls a using sexual interludes that don't mean anything. What's the recipe for a meaningful romantic life, a never wavering commitment to one sexual partner, or a succession of groin giggles to stave off the supposed dangers of routine? Let's take a look. Depuis quand dis-moi ta sexualité est devenue une activité extra conjugale? C'est c'est la loi des couples qui dure. Personne n'y échappe. Sauf que moi je t'ai jamais trompé en 25 ans. Richard. Richard. So, Lisa, is what we see really happening, or is the word magical in the title a clue? 
Aha. Well, the film's gimmick, which will either charm you or wear out its welcome, is that Maria gets a hotel room across the street from the apartment she shares with Pushing 50 Richard, only to find a 25-year-old Richard in the bedroom of the hotel suite, because Richard is also played by Vincent Lacoste the way he was when they met and fell in love. We also learn why Richard gave up playing the piano about 20 years ago. Hint, it has to do with his first love, who also puts in an unexpected appearance. The film suggests that we carry within us all the romantic entanglements we've ever enjoyed or regretted. Interesting theory. Now, the restored silent classic The Man Who Laughs is being released in France this week, the same week as The Joker. Good planning by the distributors. Oh, it's very smart programming, and here's why. Victor Hugo wrote Notre Dame de Paris, uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, about a disfigured bell ringer who yearns for love and respect. Hugo also wrote The Man Who Laughs, about a man whose face was sliced into a permanent grin by family enemies when he was young, and who imagines that the blind girl who loves him would change her mind if she could see his permanent grimace. Now, the film is from 1928, directed by Paul Lenny and starring Conrad Veidt, who you may know from the wartime classic Casablanca, made at the tail end of the silent era, The Man Who Laughs is a masterful melodrama. Now, just 12 years later, in 1940, the character of The Man Who Laughs, as he appears in this film, inspired the comic book artist who drew Batman and gave him an arch nemesis with a distinctive grin called The Joker. Now, The Man Who Laughs has stood the test of time, and I'm fairly sure will continue to do so more than the other three movies we just spoke about. Okay. Lisa, thank you very much for joining us. We're going to leave you with that. Thank you very much again. Thank you for joining us. Remember our website. We're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this.